1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, and the King James text today reads, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith, not works, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Hallelujah. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment, let's go to the Lord once again in prayer. King Jesus, Master, Savior, Redeemer, Friend, we love you, Lord. We thank you, God, today for this opportunity to explore the Word of God. Lord, to receive a word from heaven that you would deliver to our soul by reason of your God-called anointed messenger. Lord, this man who stands in this pulpit recognizes today his weakness, his frailty, his faults. And Lord, I acknowledge that without your assistance there is no possible way that I can serve the people of God well. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I need the touch of God from heaven. I need today, O oh God, for the Spirit to strike a chord in the heart of every hearer so that as I deliver the word you've laid on my heart, they might know in their spirit. It is indeed a word from God. It is not the mandate of man. It is not doctrine or dogma that was uh, put together in some room somewhere by uh, a, an agreement between ministers. This is today the word of the Lord. And Master, today you know my desire above all else is to preach the truth of God, for it is the truth of God that is able to set men, women, boys, and girls free. Oh God, today save those that are lost. As the word of God goes forth, let the healing virtue of Christ the Messiah flow today like a mighty river. As the word of God goes forth, Lord, reconcile and restore those who are backslidden. Deliver, Lord, from bondage those who are bound by addiction, Master. O oh God, today let the word of God be sent forth to heal, even at this hour, for we ask it in none other than Jesus, 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 hallelujah, Jesus, wonderful name. Praise God, amen, amen. and amen. At the onset of the Christian movement, 
after the Lord had ascended and the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ had lingered and tarried in the upper room in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father came upon them. At the beginning of this church, the beginning of this movement and this doctrine, there was great turmoil and great stress that was placed upon the people of God as they had to endure all kinds of persecution all kinds of threats and all kinds of acts that visited upon them loneliness, despair, pain, woe, fear, anxiety. It was not an easy time when this movement was born, when Christianity was given birth to. It was not an easy time. The early saints, the apostles, had to give their lives uh, in sacrifice. They had to offer themselves up as martyrs for this faith. And yet, for all that was brought upon the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, not one recanted, not one said that that which they preached was not in fact that which they had seen with their own eyes and heard with their own ears. Hallelujah. They held fast to the doctrine of a Christ who was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, performed miracles, signs and wonders as evidence of His divinity that He was crucified and that three days afterwards he rose again from the grave, triumphant over sin, over death, and over hell. Glory to God that he then ascended to glory with the promise that he would return for his church one day. Hallelujah. Not one of the apostles recanted their testimony. Many believers in the early church, many believers in the first, second, and third centuries laid down their lives for this gospel. And yet we have moronic people in our society today who want to claim persecution because the law says that if someone comes into your bakery and asks you to bake a cake for an event, then you are obligated by law simply to bake the cake. It is not your job to sit in judgment of the uh, activity that they've asked you to bake that cake for. That is not your business. You don't refuse to bake a cake for a, a baby shower that's being thrown for an unmarried woman. You don't refuse to bake a cake for a couple that is getting married and they're on their second, third, fourth, fifth, or God only knows which marriage. After numerous divorces, it is not your business to sit in judgment of other people and their conduct or their beliefs or their activities. If you're in business, then provide that service fairly, provide that service universally. That is what the government has said. And yet we have people in our country who want to try to suggest that this requirement is on the same level as having your head chopped off or being thrown to the lions for professing Christ. I'm here to tell you we are today also living in tumultuous times. We have just gone through four years with one of the most demonic, devilish, ungodly, unholy men that has ever occupied the White House, our country. For four years we were in a constant state of turmoil. We were constantly seeing anger and angst being inspired by our highest leader. Mm -hmm. We saw racism, anti-Semitism, all kinds of negativity and ungodliness flowering under this individual's administration. And yet we had men in the church who tried to tell us 
that, oh, this is the best leader that God could ever have given us. This is a godly man. This is a man who seeks after God's ways. Baloney. Baloney. During the revolutionary era in America, one of our founding fathers by the name of Thomas Paine wrote these powerful words, and I quote, These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country, but he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives us, excuse me, that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods. And it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated, end quote. Our founding fathers acknowledged that the tumultuous, difficult times that our nation experienced at the onset as patriots rose up to fight for freedom and liberty to establish these United States no longer a territory uh, no longer a colony of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. During that tumultuous time, our founding father made the point that the greater the struggle, the more precious and the more valuable the prize. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you folks, you will only struggle, you will only fight, you will only put forth the greatest effort for that which is of great value. We live today in difficult times, men of great passions, both learned and ignorant, are sparring as the fate of our constitutional democracy hangs in the balance. On one side are men who while claiming allegiance to our Constitution, are in fact working tirelessly toward a day in the which they might discard this two and a half century old document delivered to us by our wise and wearied founding fathers who had lived under tyranny and the unyielding burden of monarchy and representationless government and made their way to this continent where they became convinced it was possible for people of goodwill and reasonable minds to govern themselves by means of a constitutional democracy. These men argued and debated rigorously with those who sought to divide and weaken this continent by fashioning it after Europe where more than one nation shared a continent and history showed uh, that such an arrangement wound up embroiled in endless conflicts and wars as the interests of one nation emboldened them to ignore the interests of their neighboring nations with whom they shared borders rivers, or continental boundaries. Many people are not aware. I shared a, a Facebook Live uh, thing this week. I, you know, I've been reading, again, the Federalist Papers. And many people in this country have never read 
this incredible series of documents, the Federalist Papers, written by three of our founding fathers. Many people are not aware that at the onset of this nation, as the Constitution was being uh, put together and ratified, uh, everybody is taught in school that, you know, oh, everybody was so excited. Yay, we've got a free country. We can do as we please. And everybody just joyfully and gleefully came together and they wrote the Constitution and they all ran in the room to sign it. Happy were we. Baloney. Let me tell you, much of what we're taught in our history classes in school is fiction. It is garbage. It is foolishness. And it's sad because so many in this country are ignorant. They don't know any better because they've never done any reading for themselves. They've mm -hmm. never done any research. They've never pursued a higher education. All the avenues whereby one might learn differently. They've not pursued any of those avenues. So they walk in the ignorance of the propaganda that they have been filled with from their youth. Mm -hmm. The reality is that as the Constitution was said to be ratified by the Congress of our initial uh, colonies here in the United States of America, the several states that had been organized, the truth is there were many who were out there writing and speaking against ratification of this Constitution. They did not want all of the New World to fall under one national banner. They did not want all. Mind you, at the time, the territories that comprised the United States combined were less than a third of the territory that we now cover. They had not yet experienced the Louisiana Purchase. That came later under the uh, presidency of Thomas Jefferson. They had not yet experienced uh, adding the West to uh, the, the, the boundaries and the borders of the United States of America. They certainly had not yet purchased Alaska from the Russians. I mean, there were so many parcels that had not yet been brought into the boundaries of the United States of America. And yet as small as the New World was, there were still men in America at the time of the Constitution being ratified who wanted to split it up and divide it and create uh, multiple countries. And many people are not even aware that this is the case, but it is so. The reason three of our founding fathers wrote the Federalist Papers and published them in New York State newspapers is because they were making an argument for the Constitution that was being presented and that was going to be voted upon for ratification. And they wanted to make a sound and clear argument to the people of New York so that they would, could fully understand exactly why this Constitution and one singular federal government was so important. And at the time, the country they were debating over was just a small part of what we know today as the United States of America. Many did not want the whole of what is known today as the United States of America to fall under one federal government all sharing the singular identity of Americans. This battle today yet rages. The spirits of conflict, division, and unyielding compromise are yet alive and well within our 50 states. Many not willing to submit to laws with which they disagree, which is essential to the successful governance of any democratic republic would happily see the so-called United States divided up into parts, each having its own national identity 
and government. Only God knows which of these countries would fall into the rule of dictators and despots. Only God knows how many wars would be fought and how much blood would be spilled as men of ambition without conscience or integrity sought to achieve ends motivated by ego and self-enrichment and self-aggrandizement. How many of these smaller countries would become theocracies, oligarchies, or dictatorships? Unity is a nearly impossible end to achieve, never mind to maintain. Mm -hmm. From the beginning of time, Satan has sought to divide and to stir up contentions, knowing that there is indeed safety in numbers and smaller groups are far easier to deceive and mislead than larger groups. Mm -hmm. As Abraham Lincoln is once reported to have said, you can fool some of the people all of the time and all of the people some of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. Thomas Paine, in my quote today, in effect speaks similarly to our primary text, suggesting that only that for which we struggle can true value be attached. Those things which come easy are without any intrinsic value. Anyone can stir up hatred encourage division and inspire angst. Any fool can manufacture words which achieve these ends. But one who is able to speak healing, inspire unity, and soothe contentious men is both rare and precious. Am I telling the truth? Yep. Amen. Yep. Why does our history teach us that perhaps Abraham Lincoln was the greatest president in all of American history. Lincoln both endured and prevailed in the most difficult of times. In the end, after all his struggle and sleepless nights, it is Lincoln who is remembered as one of the United States of America's favorite sons and one of the most revered world leaders ever to have faced, uh, to have graced the face of planet earth. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm here to tell you today, we value those who have endured great struggle. We value people who have gone through great struggle because there is no value without the struggle. I, I hope you're getting my point today. I hope you're starting to apply this to yourself today and understand where the preacher's trying. To, I'm not trying to preach a message on politics today, but I'm trying to help you understand. Thomas Paine said that that which is the most valuable is that which requires the greatest struggle and the greatest sacrifice and the greatest effort to achieve and to attain. Am I telling the truth? Yep. He said, it's only those things that we must really struggle for that are of the highest value. The early church had to struggle for this faith. Why? Because this faith is precious. This faith is valuable. This faith is able to save men's souls. This faith is able to bring peace in the midst of storms. This faith is able to bring joy to the joyless and hope to the hopeless, healing to the sick, deliverance to those who are bound. This faith we preach today is of great worth and great value. And therefore, it was worth dying for. It was worth fighting for. This nation was trying to detach itself from the tyranny of a king. And freedom and liberty 
were worth fighting for. They were worth dying for. Why? Because they're of great value. Am I telling the truth? Well, I'll tell you, some of us today are going through things, including this preacher. Some of us are struggling, and we've never struggled like we're struggling. Oh, hallelujah. We're struggling like we've never struggled before in our life, and God would remind us that the things that are the most valuable are worth the struggle. You've got to understand. You say, yeah, but I'm not sure what's at the end of this struggle. Well, honey, know this. God wouldn't let you struggle this hard if at the end it wasn't something really good. Hallelujah. Yeah. Because the only things worth struggling for are things that are of great value. God knows this principle. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. God understands how this works. And therefore, if he's asking you today to struggle and to strive and to put forth the effort, then know that at the end prize worth winning. There is a trophy worth possessing. Hallelujah. There is something worth having. Our struggles exist only because that for which we strive is of great value. For instance, today the believer who strives to live with integrity, morality, and sincere piety, believes Proverbs 22 and 1, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. See, a lot of people today in our world don't appreciate at all the value of a good name. They don't appreciate at all the value of integrity. They don't appreciate at all the value of honesty. They don't appreciate at all the value of good reputation. Am I telling the mm -hmm. truth today? Yes, and right. they don't understand these things are far more valuable than they will ever know. I've experienced more blessing in my life by trying to live the way the Word of God would have me to live than I ever could have experienced when I was out there trying to fight and bite my way through life and to cheat and steal and get what I wanted to get any way I could go about getting it. I've told the story in the past about uh, I had to have a storage container moved to our property in Oklahoma from Texas and the trucking company that moved it for us wound up getting a fine, a ticket on the way up there because it was overloaded, it was overweight. Well, that was my fault. I had packed it full of stuff, and uh, it, I didn't realize, to be honest, I had no clue that uh, they were going to be weighed or that it mattered or what have you. So, you know, I, I didn't know. I don't understand how those things work. But anyway, the bottom line is, when the truck driver arrived and told me that he had been delayed because he had been stopped and given a ticket for nearly $1,000, I told him, I said, well, I don't have the money today, but I'll tell you what I will do. I said, I will pay that ticket. I can give you the $1,000 for the ticket. I said, and then you tell your boss that I'll come down there one day as soon as I'm able. I said, we've got some money coming. One of our donors is faithful in giving every year. He gives us a larger sum, a larger offering every year around, I think, you know, April or whatever it is. And I said, uh, if you can wait a few months, I will come to your offices and I will pay the cost of shipping the container. But at least this way you're getting the fine paid. So you're not responsible for that fine. Well, now the shipping alone was going to be another I now almost want to forget. I think it was like $750 or something. So anyway, uh, so I told him this. He spoke to the owner of his company. The owner said, fine, he would do that. And uh, no document was written. I never wrote a, an IOU. I never wrote anything on paper. I just told him I would do this. Well, we, I did as I said I would do. I also gave the driver a good tip a couple hundred dollar tip for his driving. Well, 
That's all the money I had available to me at the moment. A few months later, uh, Claude sent us a nice offering, as I expected he would and as he normally would. And I called this company and I said, okay, I got our money. I said, I'm ready to pay you for the shipping. Uh, where do I need to go? Where's your office at and everything? And the man told me. And I drove out there to meet him and I went there and he came uh, out to talk to me and as we were talking he said honestly Reverend he said I never in a million years thought I'd ever see you I never in a million years thought you'd show up to pay this he said I am shocked he said honestly most people today they'll tell you anything they gotta tell you and then they split and you know he said you didn't even give me an IOU or nothing all you did was promise me on the telephone months ago that you would come and pay this you know and he said I am so in shock he said but it's so refreshing and it's so wonderful to see that people Still, there are people who strive to live lives of integrity and honesty. Uh -huh. I'll tell you, a good name is rather to be chosen. Yes. If you know what's valuable, then you know that a good name is a valuable thing to possess. Well, I told him, I said, listen, my friend, if I tell you I'm going to do something, I guarantee it, I'm going to do what I told you. I said, my word is my bond. That's the way I grew up. That's the way I understand this Bible to read. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. I said, that's the way I strive to live. I'm not perfect. I'm full of faults. I do all kinds of wrong things all the time. But that's one area that I've got nailed down pretty well. Long story short, he proceeded to cut what we owed him in less uh, in about half. He said, you just tell me how much you want to pay and, I'll, and you can pay whatever amount you want. I said, no, sir, I can't do that. I did not provide the service. You provided the service. And he and I stood there literally for about 10 minutes just bickering back and forth, uh, trying to figure out who was going to name a price. I couldn't name a price on the service he provided us. I don't know what it cost him for gas. I don't know what it cost him, you know, for, for whatever, for manpower, how much he pays the driver, you know, per hour, so on and so forth. So it's up to him to determine the price. He provided the services. Finally, he turned around and said, well, how about if we just say, I think, $350 or $400, and we'll call it even. And I said, well, that is so wonderful. I said, thank you. I appreciate that so much. You see, we saved a bundle on that transaction all because I was a man of my word and mm -hmm. because I valued mm -hmm. a good name. Amen. Nothing worth having comes easily or without struggle. People look at those who attain and achieve because of familial relationships or social privilege with contempt. As it is known, they did not struggle or strive to seize their success, but rather had it handed to them on a proverbial silver platter. The man who rises from poverty and obscurity to achieve great wealth or achievement in business, politics, or social impact and influence is revered and valued far more than the one born sucking on a silver pacifier. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Oh, I want to tell you today, children of God, your struggle today is because your goal is precious. It is valuable. If just anybody could easily lay hold on that for which you strive, what value would there be in it? When you have at last rested hold of that for which you strive, you above all others will know the value of your possession. Only the one who has struggled and conquered can truly know the full value of his or her trophy. Amen. Am I telling the truth today? Praise God. Amen. In James chapter 5 verses 10 and 11, James writes, Take, my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. 
Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. James points us when he speaks of struggle, when he speaks of pain and trouble, he points us to the prophets. You know, it's so funny. I have to laugh at how many people in the church today, uh, how many people in churches want to run around calling themselves prophets. Makes me laugh. Oh, I'm telling you. Because they think if they get up, and they prophesy words that people want to hear. If they say things people want to hear. And they're able to make people happy and get... Honey, you are playing the same game that these false mediums and these false, uh, you know, uh, psychics play. Mm -hmm. You're playing the same identical game. You're just approaching it different. Mm -hmm. They sit there and tell people what they want to hear as if the message is coming from the dead. Mm -hmm. And that makes the hearer happy and they fork over their money in order to support that medium or to support that psychic. And then we have people that call themselves prophets, Tommy, who stand up in the pulpit and they tell the people, oh, God said this and God said that and they give them all kinds of good news, good news, good news, good news, good news. Mm -hmm. Everything's positive. Everything's mm -hmm. good. And of course, the churches are thrilled to death. They have these. I remember going to a church one time years ago, a Church of God in Christ, and they had a fellow coming through who was well known. Prophet, I'm not going to name his name, but a certain fellow. And boy, I mean, to you, what a show he put on. What a show he put on. Everything he had to say was good. Everything he had to say was positive. Everything he had to say made people happy to hear it. And I sat there and I thought to myself, isn't it funny how people that want to call themselves prophets today never sound a warning in Zion like the prophets of old did. Never tell the people of God where they're going astray. Never warn the church when they're going in the wrong direction. Never rebuke a preacher for preaching a false message. Never stand up for right in the face of the church doing wrong. But somehow or another, these prophets, you know, they're supposed to be true and genuine prophets. I'm going to tell you a little secret, honey. God told me when he called me to preach that I was going to have a prophetic ministry. Oh, I'm going to tell you, my Lord have mercy. When he told me I was going to have a prophetic ministry, I began to research. I'm talking as a kid. I was like 12 when he told me this. I began to search the scriptures, and he said I'd have a ministry like that of John the Baptist. And boy, I mean, I began to research John the Baptist, and I began to look into the prophets. And I said, my God have mercy. There is no more hated a class of people than the prophets. There is nobody in the church that people love to hate more than a prophet. I remember we were sitting, Tommy, you might remember, I think you and I together were at this black church here in Dallas. We were visiting an apostolic church years and years and years ago. And they invited me up to the front being a pastor and all. And uh, this one lady got up and she started talking about this house that she found that she was all excited about and everything. And as she was speaking, the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, that's not the house for her. She doesn't need that house. If she walks into that, she's going to have nothing but trouble and woe. You need to warn her. And I thought, oh dear God, why in the world, Lord, must you tell me this? Why must I be the one? But somebody has to be there so when you make a mess and you walk into a pile of horse dew, you can't stand there and blame God for it. Hello now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, the primary reason that a prophet exists, my friend, is not to sound warning. No. It took me a lot of years to figure this out. A lot of years to figure this out. The Holy Ghost in recent months helped me to realize this. Said. The primary purpose of a prophet is not to sound warning, not to change the hearer's course. No, it's not the primary responsibility of a prophet. The primary job of the prophet is to sound the warning. Listen to me. 
so that when that individual, when that nation, when that leader, when that pastor, when that member of the church, when that believer stands before God in the judgment, they cannot for one second bring accusation against God. They cannot for one second say, but Lord, you never told me, you never warned me. I had no idea. The Lord said, your job is to speak that which I tell you to speak. He said, that doesn't mean the people are going to listen to it, but what it does mean is when they stand before me in the judgment and they try to act like they're without fault for the mess they walked into, I'm going to be able to look them right in the eye and say, oh no, baby, I told you. I spoke to you through the prophet. I gave you a word. I told you. Don't you dare try to stand here and tell me that you're faultless, that you're blameless in this thing. Hello now. Oh, when I've gotten up in this pulpit and I've warned America and I've warned the church in America about the evils of this demon called Trump and I've tried to warn the people of God who are without discernment and without uh, eyesight and not able to see what is uh, going on and what this man truly is because leadership in, this, uh, in the church today has led them astray. Some of the biggest names in the church world today are the biggest false prophets that have ever walked the face of the planet. You've heard me say it, folks. So if you want to keep on following every word they say, if you want to believe everything Franklin Graham has to say, if you want to believe everything that uh, old Jeffries here in Dallas has to say, you just keep believing it. But when you stand before God in the judgment and God holds you responsible for following after their false lead, even when it led you down paths that were clearly contradictory to the way of truth, were clearly contradictory to the Word of God, clearly contradictory to the way of the Spirit. Honey, you ain't going to be able to look at God and say, well, Lord, I, I didn't know any better. He was my leader. No, you heard this little voice in the wilderness crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord today. If you're hearing my voice and you're hearing this message, if you've heard other messages I've preached that sounded the warning, then sweetheart, you are without excuse. That is what a prophet's job is, to make certain that when people stand before God in their judgment, they are without excuse. That is how righteous God is. That is how perfect God is. That is how loving God is. He ain't going to let you go to the jail without fully understanding, I warned you not to do that. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Your struggle today is because your goal is precious and valuable. Peter pointed us to the struggles of the prophets. He pointed us to the struggles of Job. Well, I'm going to tell you, there's nobody on this planet that's ever endured the troubles and the trials that Job endured. And yet in the end, God blessed Job in ways that we could not even fathom. I'm going to tell you folks, I have been on the edge of death myself, literally. Literally on the edge of death. Twice, twice I've experienced my spirit leaving my body. Twice during the same hospitalization in 2000. And the Lord asked me, do you want to come home or do you want to stay? Twice my first initial answer was, Lord, I want to go home. I was so tired, I can't even describe how physically and psychologically and emotionally and spiritually tired I was. I can't even begin to explain to you how tired I was. I had no more fight in me. I said, Lord, I'm ready. I want to go home. I want to go home. And I felt my spirit begin to rise from my body literally. And I, I, I've explained to you before that the sensation of liberation and freedom, the sensation of separation from all negative emotion and everything uh, of this earth, I, I can't even describe it. It was the most amazing thing I've ever experienced. I never felt anything like it in my life. I had no anxiety. I had no fear. I had no worry. I wasn't thinking about my family. I wasn't thinking about nothing. 
But then all of a sudden, and I know God put the thought in my head, all of a sudden I remembered my little church, my little affirming church, and those few LGBT people that were in that little church in New Haven, Connecticut, that I was trying to build. And I thought, oh Lord, if I leave now, what are they going to do? There is no pastor waiting. There is nobody waiting in the wings to come and take over the work that I've begun. And I realized I needed to stay for them. And immediately I felt my spirit land. I, I can't even say return to my body. I have to say it just landed back in my body. And it literally, literally felt like a thud. Literally. I, I can't even describe it. And then as I go to raise my hand a little bit, my hand felt like it weighed 10,000 pounds. I'll never forget it as long as I live. And I remember thinking to myself, my God, I never realized how much effort it takes to move our body. See, my spirit was back in the body. I didn't have that freedom, that liberty that I was feeling before. All of a sudden, it, I begin to realize, Lord have mercy, bodies are heavy. Boy, it takes a lot to move these things around. I was on life support. I was intubated at the time. Happened a second time. And the same thing happened. And I said, Lord, I can't go. I've got to stay. And then immediately after I thud back into my body the spirit of the Lord spoke to me as plain as day and said to me if I ask you again this same question you had better know your answer because there will be no going back and boy I'm going to tell you all of a sudden this feeling of of importance came over me and I understood how important it was that I make up my mind and that I know what my answer would be if the Lord asked me again. You see, all of a sudden I really began to put thought into it and I really began to think about it and as I sat there and I thought about it and I thought about it and I thought about it, I finally realized, that I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, God just offered me, the Lord is telling me that I've got the decision between life and death. He's not making that decision for me. He, he's leaving that up to me. God didn't say to me, you know how people say, well, when your number's up, your number's up. Not necessarily so. No, if you're determined to do the work God's called you to do, honey, if you know what your purpose is, if you know what your calling is, if you know what your place in this life is, and you know you haven't finished, then believe me, all you got to do is let the Lord know that, and He's going to say, you're right, you stay, you follow me now. Well, I'm going to tell you, I begin to think about it, and I begin to realize, I realized, I said, Lord, I have to stay, I have to stay, because there is such a work in the LGBT community that needs to be done. There are many preaching in our community, but few are preaching this message that I believe is the message. we got many people in our community today being led astray, being led into uh, a false message of universalism, being led into a false message of permissiveness. That as God's children, we can just do whatever we feel like doing. And all will be well with the Lord in the end. No, it, you know, it's not about earning heaven. But I'm going to tell you, if God sees you make no effort to show your appreciation or your gratitude for the salvation that He's afforded you by grace, you're in trouble. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The unprofitable servant that the Lord spoke of in parable wound up experiencing the same end as the unbeliever. He was cast into outer darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. So you need to be a profitable servant. But I want to say, Pastor, why are you telling us this story? This doesn't, this doesn't keep with your message. Yes, it does. I'm going to get it back there in a second. I finally realized that I needed to stay, and that that was where I needed to be. Here's where it ties in. Never in my life have I been in worse physical, psychological, spiritual condition than I was lying on that hospital bed at Yale New Haven Hospital, New Haven, Connecticut, 135 pounds, bone and 
skin, basically. Never have I been in such horrific shape, in such horrific condition. And when I thought about staying, when I thought about what it would require of me to stay and to continue the work that I had begun, Tommy, all I could see was struggle. All I could see was hardship. I imagined myself for the rest of my life probably in a wheelchair. I imagined myself for the rest of my life sickly and weakly. You know what I'm saying? I was in such a condition I couldn't picture myself healed and healthy and well. No, I said, well, the Lord may leave me here, but I may be in, in the kind of condition I'm in now, you know, for the rest of my life. I couldn't even envision myself in better condition and healthy and, 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 you know, having weight back on my bones and being able to move about freely and to walk. I literally pictured myself probably in a wheelchair and struggling, you know, but I had made up my mind that if that's what it took for me to do the work that God had given in my heart. Mm. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. If that's what it was going to take for me to keep doing what God called me to do, then that's what I was going to do. You know why? Because the most valuable things are worth the effort. No matter how hard, no matter how difficult. I want to finish that story just so you know how it ended. When I made up my mind, I said, Lord, I, I realized, I, I, I know now why you twice offered me to go home and you twice allowed me to come back because you were wanting me to realize how important and how valuable the work I was doing was. I said, well, I've come to realize that. And if you ask me again, Lord, I know. Whew, so I know what my answer will be. And immediately, immediately, he turned up on us, she on my high. Oh, glory. Immediately, the Holy Ghost spoke to me. I'll never forget it as long as I live. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, You shall not die. Woo! He said, But you shall live. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. My mother came in to see me and they had a, a pad of paper that they kept for me in a crayon. I couldn't have a pen or a pencil. I was intubated, you know. They didn't want me stabbing myself because sometimes you'd see delusions and all kind of things. And I wrote on that paper, I'm going to live. And my mother looked at me and said, how do you know? And I wrote, God told me. Hallelujah. Because when God tells you, it's as good as gold. It's as Amen. good as done. I never dreamed that a few days later, Brother Ronnie Pig and his church would send me a prayer cloth that they had prayed over on my behalf. And that I'd open that package and I'd pull it out and I'd say, All right, Lord, they're believing you for a miracle, so I'm believing you for a miracle. Let's get it done. That's all I thought. Those are the words that I thought. Let's get it done. Boy, talk about a fancy prayer, huh? The next day, the next day I was taken off of life support after nearly a month, intubated by mouth. The next day I was taken off life support and I began to recover and the doctor said, we don't know what's turned, the, we don't know what's doing it because it's not anything we've done. We knew no treatment for you. We couldn't figure out what to do for you or how to help you. Therefore, we were simply trying to keep you comfortable until you passed. He said, we have no clue what has turned the tide. He said, but you're recovering. And you're recovering at a supernatural rate. Hallelujah. I struggled and I struggled for the first several months. I had to walk with a cane. I could do precious little walking. I couldn't even walk from the car into the grocery store uh, without running out of breath and becoming weak, and I would literally, if I wasn't careful, I'd fall in the middle of a store because I had no strength in my body initially. 
The doctors told me I might not ever walk again because my legs had atrophied so bad being in such condition for so long. But every time I got up from my bed, I'd take that cane and I'd say, Jesus walked on water, I can walk on land. Jesus, I'll never forget it so long as I live. I literally said that phrase probably 10,000 times or more. I said, Jesus walked on water, I can walk on land. If Jesus walked on water, I can walk on land. If Jesus walked on water, I can walk on land. Hallelujah. And I kept doing that. And I kept it. And I forced myself to walk after a while. At first, I would use those little electric carts, you know, that go around the store. But as time went by, I had no appetite. I couldn't eat. It took me almost a year just to get an appetite, an appetite back. Um, I had to force my, my mother will tell you, I had to force myself to eat a quarter of a sandwich. If she made me a sandwich and cut it in quarters, it took everything I could do just to force myself to eat a quarter of a sandwich. Had no appetite. I struggled and I struggled and I struggled. And I have been struggling in affirming ministry since day one and it hasn't let up a lick. And I still struggle. But I believe that what is possible at the end of all this is well worth the struggle. Amen. Because the struggle is what gives our prize value. Am I telling the truth? You may be struggling today. You may be going through great difficulty today, my friend. And sometimes you wonder why God doesn't just make it easier for you. Why He doesn't just hand it to you so that you don't have to go through all this struggle. Oh, let me tell you why. Because at the end of all this struggle is a prize well worth having. Hallelujah. It's a prize you're going to value and you're going to appreciate. It'll be worth far more than you ever thought it could be worth. Because today these are the times that try men's souls. You're just going through a time now that is putting your spirit, your soul, your walk with God to the test. But in the end... You will possess a prize. You will possess a trophy that the struggle will have established the value for. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Praise the name of the Lord.